Thank you. Psalms 147, one is our theme for today. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Amen. So if you remember when you were first in love, maybe if you can remember like me way back, high school days maybe, and you know, you can have a seat, brother. In the high school days, you all of a sudden you get together and you see that woman, you think, whoa, and you're writing her and you're calling her or you're writing him and you're thinking about him. That's how God wants us to pursue him. He's beautiful. Can you say amen? All right. This is the name of our title today, As We See the Day Approaching. Many people have come to me and they said, well, pastor, how do we know in what time period we're in? So much is going on all the time. How do we know where we sit in God's timetable? How many ever had that question? Amen. So as we begin to study today, we're going to begin to answer these things. The word is so cool. It gives us the insight and the blueprint for a strong and stable life. Look at your neighbor and say, strong and stable. You're strong and stable. Now, your head might immediately say, well, you're not necessarily. You're this, you're this, that. That's your old man talking. Will you tell your old man shut up? I'm talking to somebody over here. Don't listen to your old man. Look what it caused you. Pain and suffering. The old man is supposed to be what? Crucified. Amen? By meeting with God every day, you lay your flesh down at the altar. Amen? And God fills you, tunes you, gets you adjusted, and says, go get them. Can you say amen? I'm with you. Go into uh, What's the first two letters of God? What's the first three letters of Satan? There you go. Don't sit. Do stuff for God. Amen. So let's go on, okay? There are a tremendous amount of treasures hidden in the scripture, and we're going to dig some up. The question has been, though, in the timetable of God, what is the difference between the rapture or the catching away and the second coming? They're not the same. Questions are, how close are we before the Lord comes to get us? Questions are, what are the signs? How can we... We, we tell that it's getting close. Good questions, right? In fact, they asked Jesus those questions. And so let's get into it. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There's a couple of key words in here I want to point out to you. And I also want to make sure that you get this. Because as a Christian, as a Christian, who lives in you? Okay, you need to be real, real confident. God lives in me. So therefore, you got your ticket. Can you say amen? You're going to go. And your seat's reserved. Your ticket's paid. Jesus paid it. Your seat's reserved. And we're going to take a flight out of here. So how do I know, Pastor Kerry, that I will be ready? Now, how many has ever had children and remember the time that your child, the first time that child was defiant against you? You can go ahead and nod at me. I, mean, I, I was that way constantly. Thank God God saved me. But the defiance, because you have, now listen to me carefully. We're going to get into this. Because of our ability to be defiant, because it's in our flesh to be defiant, to go against what is right. That's the danger zone about whether you're going or not. Okay? Now, none of you are defiant against God. Can you say amen? Or you wouldn't be here at church. But the, and don't please don't think that somebody you know is defiant. You can tell a defiant person because they'll flip God off. They'll talk down, they'll talk nasty about God's people. It's defiance. Now, most of those people are not saved, but every once in a while, you'll run into somebody that was saved and then kind of got away from the Lord. Sometimes those are the most miserable. Remind me to tell you a story while I'm cooking hamburgers out here for you. 
about one defiant Christian that God gloriously delivered. And I'm not referring to me. You know, it happened to be some guy that I saw. He came down, he was going to punch my lights out, and he was going to do this, and he was going to do that. And it wasn't a week later I saw him down at the altar, not my altar, but down the altar of Life Center, repenting, and asking Jesus it back into his heart. So it doesn't pay to be defiant. Because that's the only thing that will keep you from going. Everyone say, say it again, Pastor. So if you are defiant to God at the moment God says, come, you're going to stay. But guess what? You're not that dumb. <laughs> Remember that. <clears throat> only the people are totally into themselves. Totally think they're right and everybody else is wrong. Christians are the ones that could slip into their area of defiance. Say, not me. First Thessalonians 5, listen to this. In verse 1. So, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, I have no need to write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, not us, when the world shall say, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them, not us. These little words are very important when you read. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. Who? They shall not escape. But you and I got our ticket. Our seat is reserved. How do you know that for sure? Because the devil tells me I'm not going, and everything he says is a lie. <laughs> if the devil's telling you you're not going, you might as well pack your bags, you're on your way. Amen? When the devil says you're not healed, you better believe the opposite because he's a liar and he cannot tell the truth. Moving right on past this, listen. And they shall not escape, but you, say me, Brethren are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as a thief. Who's the thief in the Bible? Satan works in darkness. He hates to be exposed. And right now, the church is getting brighter and lighter and more on fire, and the world's getting darker and darker. And listen, if it's a dark world out there, even a match can be seen for a long way. So you could be a match or a torch. What do you want to be? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that day overtakes you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. Say amen. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, because of that very truth, therefore let us not sleep. What does he mean there, Pastor Kerry? He's talking about Christians don't be sleeping Christians. Don't be asleep. Be alert. Be awake. Can you say amen? Don't just sit there and sort of just carry from day to day. No, you should be interchanging, interacting with God. Good to see you. Amen. All right. I got the message this morning. Anyway, so, so anyway, what God is trying to do with our heart is he's trying to see that we operate in a whole different system. But the way the enemy makes it work is, oh, it could be really iffy whether you're going to go or not. And here's another dumb thing. How many here believe God's consistent? He doesn't change, right? Doesn't he say, I am God, I won't change, I change not? Jesus, same yesterday. Listen, there are people out there, they don't even know if there is a rapture because they don't get close to God. They're speculating about scripture instead of getting to know the one who created everything. God is very consistent. And before a judgment comes, he pulls the righteous out. Let's, let's look at a couple examples. What did he do with Noah? He pulled him out. What did he do with Lot? He pulled him out. Hello. God always pulls the righteous out of trouble. We'll see this several times in our lesson today. So the idea is Satan wants to skew and mess up our thinking about God's love for us, thinking that, well, if we mess up, remember, you have Almighty God living on the inside of you, and he is there. So when God starts to approach to get us, guess who's going to go off in you? 
God. <laughs> and some of you are starting to sense it now. Because you can feel God's about ready to launch. Are you with me? So we don't look to the world because it's passing away. We look to win souls. For he that wins souls is wise. Are you still with me? So let's read on. Verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep. Don't be a sleepy Christian as others do. Let us not be drunk as others are. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for the helmet, get your mind set on the hope of your salvation. For God did not appoint us, listen, to his wrath. Oh, God's leading us through the mud. He's putting us through the crud to teach us some kind of marvelous lesson. That's called religion. In fact, there's somebody sitting here, you have been exposed to religion, and religion has worked a little bit, but you are suffering in a deeper relationship. Let me encourage you to build a relationship and not just a practice of religion. Say amen, somebody. All right, now, hear this. But let us who are of the day put on the breastplate of faith, love, and a helmet for the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to his wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, did you notice on the way back it says that them, it says, did you notice that it says them, them people, different than you, Every time you see a separation like the Israelites in the world, you see Christians in the world, not, not that anybody is terrible, it's just we are of a different set now. You're a son and child of God. Do you ever hear this one? I love this one. Well, I'm just an old sinner. Say, grace. What, what are you, an old sinner? Are you saved by grace? See the double mind? Satan is a master at division and getting you to pose yourself. You know, one minute you're on fire, and somebody says something, and immediately you're depressed. See, your mind is not on God. It's on you. So let's move right on. Second point I want to give you, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Why would he come like a thief in the night? Well, you don't understand, but Satan, right now, this is the enemy's time. This is his big distraction going on. Okay? He's been working really hard to get everybody to have an alternative other than God. You see, another Christ. Come over here, join my organization kind of thing. You know, we can give you the formula. And we have one of those down the end of the street. All they have is formulas. There's no salvation because they don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. All right, so third thing, remember that you are two people. Old person and a new person. Look at your neighbor and say, old person and new person. <laughs> I said person because you can have an old man, but you don't want to say old woman. Okay, all right. Moving right past that. There's two of you, the old man and the new man. We are the new man indwelt by God, so we operate from the new man. You lay your old man on the altar every day. Otherwise, it'll get up and tag along with you. And get you in trouble by saying things you don't mean and meaning things you don't say. Hello. Amen. And then, then it goes on. Okay. Now, as we see the day approaching, we need to be alert and energized because God dwells on the inside of us. The fourth point is notice the mention of the birth pangs of a pregnant woman. Now, some of you ladies have wonderful children. You remember those times. Can you say amen? And as you get closer to birth, the pains and all these things are, you know, remember the back pain and all, and it's, we won't go on to that. You've been delivered. Amen. So, and so she is going to give birth. Now, folks, a pregnant woman gives birth, right? Here it says that the age that you and I are living in is like a pregnant woman, and she's pregnant with something. She's pregnant with the church. And the devil is so anti-church. And we're growing in the womb of God's presence and kingdom. 
There's going to be a birthing here quick. That we're going to go to meet him. We're going to be snatched out of here. So the birth pangs are like a pregnant woman. Why are the pains? Because the world is rejecting God. Don't you read the Bible? The world is trying to reject God. And we're around. So there's a pain and birthing and reminding until one day Jesus says, Hup, come on. And then everybody, for the first few weeks, the devil's going to say, oh, they're gone. Shh, those troublemakers, they're the ones that are fighting our abortion and are doing this, are coming against this and everything. Thank God that our alien friends have showed up. Hey, folks, don't you realize that according to Scripture, he says that the enemy will come with all lying signs and wonders. So that's why God wants our eyes on him and not what the enemy's doing, because he's quite a circus act. I've seen people in circuses do phenomenal things with the enemy guiding them. You talk to those people afterwards, and they don't confess Jesus. They confess the occult or the paranormal. You see, when we seek for supernatural things without going through Christ, without seeking God for them, then we will get supernatural things, but you won't like what shows up. Some would say, uh-oh. And number five, my fifth point, is notice we are children of light. What happens to darkness when you flip the light on? Aren't you glad for switches in the house, George? Amen. When you flip the light out, what happens to the darkness? It goes away. <laughs> How come we don't bring that over in our walk with the Lord? You see, what it is, is we're thinking about it, we're believing, we're hoping that this is true, yet all the time God says, I'm here with you. And so God has to take us transitionally through our walk until it becomes a revelation and a reality. And it's so much that we could care less about what the enemy's doing because he's just a noise and a distraction. How focused are you? Get up in the morning, God gives you your instructions, tells you who to call, tells you where to go, tells you what to do. And in the meanwhile, he says, the rest of the time, just have fun. Now, to me, that's the walk that God describes in the Bible. Those that walk in the Spirit shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, there's a separation of the flesh, Spirit, flesh, Spirit. We separate in the morning first thing, and we don't have to worry about the flesh that follows our surround during the day. You see, once I soak my flesh in God, it serves me. If I don't soak my flesh in God, it will serve it. And I'll find myself a little vacillations and things like that. And that's not a solid walk. Say, oh me, someone. So we're children of light. Light chases away darkness. Therefore, don't be sleepy. Realize, watch and pray. Realize who you are. And that you're a city set on a hill. You're a light. Amen. All right, my next point. Don't be shaken. This is a time for you to be solid and not shaken. Amen. Get up in the morning and you know the enemy already doesn't like you. So why are you so surprised he might insult you or call your name? And you say, well, how do I know he's calling me a name? Because you can hear your voice with his words running through your brain saying, hey, you're an idiot. Have you ever heard that come through your brain? That and your words and your voice? That's what the devil does. That's how he builds double-mindedness. I hear him periodically. I'm serving God. All of a sudden, this weird thought comes through, and it's in my voice. And I'm thinking, first time I heard that, you know what I did? I rebuked that in the name of Jesus. I rebuked that. And he started doing it all the time. And so I was running around going, I rebuked that. I rebuked that. I really rebuked that. Don't do that. Just simply ignore him. One thing a prideful devil doesn't like is to be ignored. Nothing he can do about it because he has to go through God to get to us. We are in Christ, hidden in God. Never forget that. Okay. Don't be shaken. Second Thessalonians 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen to this. This is cool. Starting with verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and to our gathering together unto him. Everyone say gathering together. That's the rapture. Okay, so I would like to know the difference between the rapture and the second coming. How many would like to know? Because most people mess it up. They have no idea. You see, when Jesus comes to get us, he does not touch the ground. He calls us up into the clouds. Hello. So it will appear that we're there one moment and boom, we're gone. And next thing you know, the Antichrist is going to say, I guess the UFO's got him. Or something dumb like that. Right? But there's going to be millions upon tens of millions of people suddenly missing. We're going to show you a clip of what it's really like. So I hope you're not too sleepy. All right? So listen. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you. Everyone say deceive. You see, deception is Satan's business. He hasn't got any physical, spiritual power. He just has the power to deceive and con you if you let him. Okay, catch me. Okay, don't be soon shaken, troubled, a spirit, or in word, by a letter from us. Okay, let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless there's a falling away first. Take a look out there. Church attendance. Everybody's just kind of busy. And by the way, I must say, most churches are too boring to hang if it wasn't for the music. <laughs> don't, don't get mad at me. You're not getting much word out of there and everything like that. God wants every church to become a training center and a focal point of launch. You understand? Where we get what we need and we tank up. Everyone say filling station, not dumping station. Churches are never a dumping station. You deal with your problems with God at home. You don't bring them to the church and spread them around to everybody. Pray for me. My husband beat me with a great big pepperoni stick. Wish Sherry was here. <laughs> okay. You guys, you guys getting anything out of this? Sure you are. Now, well, listen. So we don't want to be shaken. The only way we can't, we, we've got to remain our walk in Christ, and we can do that. All right. Sorry, it says, let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless there's a falling away first. People have other interests. And the man of sin, that's the Antichrist, will be revealed. The son of perdition who opposes, listen, and exalts himself above all that's called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Everyone say, note it. Note that very little statement, okay? Because we're going to show you a couple of things. Point one that I want to give you. Notice Paul writes to them concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our, you and I, is gathering together unto him. What do we do on Sunday? Yeah, what do we do for Bible study? What do we do when we get together with people we love? We gather together, and in who's in the midst of that? Who's in the midst of our marriages and stuff? God, if he's not, put him there, whether your husband or wife likes it or not. Say amen. All right, let's move right on. Now, it's very important that we understand the differences between the rapture and the second coming. So let me go over them again. In the rapture, we go to meet him in the air and the clouds. Not everyone will see him. Only the church will meet him in, in the second coming or, or when Jesus comes to to touch ground just before the millennium, every eye will see him. We won't go anywhere. We will come with him riding on horses to judge the Antichrist and get rid of all evil and set up the millennial reign. Say amen. You will be there. Now, whether or not you're going to teach many people or not depends on how quick you grow and how faithful you are. Because you won't have a beat up body anymore. You'll be like a spring chicken. 
and you'll be healthy. You'll be going around teaching people during the millennial reign under Jesus. Amen. Just give you a glimpse. All right, let's go on. Now, let's go on a little bit and, and get this. In the rapture, we go to meet him. In the second coming, he comes down and touches earth. This gathering together is what we call the rapture. And how can I know that I'm going? Well, I'm glad you asked. So go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to tell you the history of the Thessalonians is they were really in tuned to when the Lord was going to come. They were just focused on that. Now, the problem is they were getting all kinds of false teachers telling them, hey, you guys missed it. <laughs> you missed your first trip. God's come and gone. Because they didn't know the truth. They were talking about when Jesus first came and left. You missed it. And all everybody was upset. No, he's going to come and get us. You see, and so they were troubled. And Paul sets them straight. And he writes two letters about it. All right, so look at what it says. Verse, verse, was it 15? I think it's 15 or 16. 15. For this we say to you, say me, by the word of the Lord, that we who were alive... And remain unto the coming of the Lord. This is the rapture. Will be no means go before them who are asleep, who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel. With the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, those that have died before us. Their bodies going to rise up. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Together with the Lord in the clouds to meet him in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the difference is we're going to meet him. Now, folks, we're going to go up there for seven years. Okay? During the seven years that we go up and we are trained and we're sitting under the feet of Jesus, the earth is going through seven years of tribulation like a pregnant woman. The Antichrist is coming into power. God, the whole world's rejected God. And at the moment we go, there's not one believer. Because we all left. Then in a matter of split seconds, all the people that heard you say, you need to be ready. Jesus is coming. After you left, we're going to fall on their face and say, oh my gosh, they were right. Millions of them. When the planes start dropping out of the air because the both pilots are Christians, well, we see the movie where God just glides the plane on down. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. No, I just see an absolute chaotic mess. Remember, Satan comes up out of a chaotic mess and starts to project false peace. The end of this is hard. Get my teaching on the book of Revelation. You understand the book of Revelation? Get my teaching. The book of Revelation is not hard at all. It just has some slippery religious statements that have to be removed so you can see. There are seven keys to the book of Revelation. Once you know them, it comes right together. you got to know what time period he's talking about. Is it a heaven story? Is it an earthly story? Is it just an informational chapter? You see? There's a lot of stuff. That's why I wish I had all day, every day for with you. But my wife says no. I want to pump you full of the word like my pastor did to me. It was so full of the word, we'd have to go home. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So, we say through the word of the Lord that God's coming to get us. Amen. A couple of points. Because we received Jesus Christ into our hearts, we are stamped. We have our ticket. You guys ready with that clip? And we're, and we're ready to get on board with our flight. Can you say amen? Two, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, all of us will vanish. Amen. When we go up, Satan shows up.
Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... Even so, come quickly, Lord. Thanks, guys. Lights. So, you've got that to look forward to at any moment now. Everything has been fulfilled. So, the funny thing about it is, I'm sure that we have more time left to win souls. But the idea is we should live like this could happen at any moment, because it could. And we should plan our lives like God's going to take forever. The reason being is, if you just shut everything down and say, well, I'm just going to wait for the rapture, well, that's foolish. But if you know that this is going to happen, then you'll always, every day, be ready, but still go after souls. Start businesses. You know, occupy, prosper, buy homes, do all of those kinds of things for the glory of God instead of doing it and matching up what the Joneses do. I got a neighbor over here constantly when I'm on my lawn, they have to mow theirs. It doesn't even need mowing. I went over to look a couple times. Anyway, so whatever the, that is, that's just worldly stuff. Do you know that you have something much, much more than anything in the world? And not only that, God says, you see, this world is beautiful. But take a look at the stars. All that's yours also. You're just locked from visiting it. Until you get your bodies and everything changed. All right, so go with me to Matthew 24, and we'll finish up. Matthew 24 is a wonderful, wonderful book. You see, how many know there's four Gospels? What are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Each one is written from the author's perspective. So we have the same story in the different perspectives. For example, Matthew talks about God as a, uh, Jesus Christ as the king, as deity. Well, Mark talks about Jesus as being a servant, an ox. Because if you read Mark, it's quick. And immediately, and immediately, and immediately, they're just the servitude. And, and in Luke, it's humanity. Luke writes about the, the, the man Christ Jesus. So, and then John the soon and coming king, amen, almighty God, Jesus, our focal point. And so we have the four gospels, amen. By the way, that's how they named four square. <laughs> and it's just a little insight for you. Anyway, um, so it goes on past this. Matthew 24, look at verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, remember, everybody really wants to know how close are we you know, and what I want to tell you is you sit with God every day, he will tell you. He will tell you how close. He won't tell you the exact day because he doesn't know. But he will tell you to get ready what to do. That's why the best thing I as a pastor can do is not teach you about God, is get you to meet with God first. Then what I teach about God becomes a reality. All right, so. Now he that sat on the mount, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, now listen to the three questions. When will these things be? One, what will be the sign of your coming? Two, and the end of the age. Everyone say age. Means segment of time, okay? Doesn't mean the end of the world. It means the end of the segment of time, all right? Okay, so then it goes on. Jesus answered it to them. Got the egg, I'm sorry. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one what? Man, folks, biggest thing is get you away from God. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away, drawn away, drawn away into their own lusts and likes. Okay, so catch that. So I love this. Okay, here we go. 
And you will hear of, I love this, and Jesus said, take heed, no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Now here, let me broaden this. This is not just saying people are saying, I'm Christ. That is involved. But there are organizations that say we represent Christ. Now, I'm not talking about good Jesus representations, like, you know, Lutheran and different things. I'm talking about cults that don't have the blood of Jesus, that don't teach about the Lord. These are substitutes for the real thing. Hello? For example, how many know the world has a lot of religions? Right? Now, let me ask you, do you know anything about any of them? Probably not. And yet they're there. Let me tell you, man, when they're trying to reach God, will make a religion. Listen to me carefully. When they're trying to reach God, will make a religion. But you see, us, God reached us and gave himself to us. That's the difference. All religions of the world, man is trying to get to God. But folks, God came to us. You see how tricky the enemy is? And if you look at some of those religions, they're immense. So that tells me Satan had a lot to do with their religions. India, they have over three million gods. How did they get like that? Because every demon that was working over there demanded that people worship them. So they got so many demons that they were worshiping them. That's how that religion started. Look it up. Buddhism. How many here remember Jay-Z Knight up there in, in what's, a, what's the name of that town? Yeah. yeah. She's a Buddhist because Buddhists are just channels. They invite the spirit from wherever, come into them, talk through them. And so you see the Buddha. You guys, man, I, let me give you my education. See, the Buddha... Constantly are different people yielded to the same boogaloo. <laughs> so you see the same fat guy, excuse my expression, yielding because he's open to the demonic expression, having demons talk through him. And then when he die out, they pull in another one. Now I've been to the Buddhist thing, checking them out, eating the good Thai food. But I went in there, and they got like 20 Buddhists sitting up there. So if this one's dropped dead, they just move the next one in. <laughs> so we don't know because this is hidden from us, folks. If you get a chance to look at some of the clips that I have on India and some of the immense carvings out of solid stone, you know the devil and his demons did that. It wasn't anybody with copper tools and wooden handles doing that. And the greatest mystery about the whole thing is nobody can find all the rocks that they chiseled out of the mountain. What happened to all of that? Who took all of that, that junk that they chiseled out of all of those rocks and hauled it away? There's no trace of it anyway. What do they do, Liqui liquefy it? We're talking about demonic forces that used to be with God, that God gave them immense equipment, and when they rebelled against God, they hid it in this planet. And we keep finding it. And our government says, oh, we better not tell them about that. And our government says, we better not tell them about that. It'll destroy their religion. Please destroy our religion and let Jesus come quickly. So if you would like to know more about that weird stuff out there, I have some great stuff on it, and I constantly bring it back on Jesus. and Why we have those things. They're all there to be a distraction. I mean, you go to Peru, you find elongated skulls that are flat, and they're not, they're not headboarded. They're flat. They're demonic creatures. They didn't come from space. They came from inner space. You see, one more thing, and then we'll finish. This planet's quarantined. Nobody's getting off this planet with boogaloos and the flesh that we got. Folks, come on. And we went one time without permission to the moon, and we were told, get on back there. If you're going to come out, you send machines. We don't want your, your stinking flesh out here. Hello. Now, what are you going to do about that? Prove me wrong. 
This, this whole planet's quarantined. God won't let Satan off this planet. And the only way that we're going to get out of here is God's going to come rescue us. And he's going to whip us out of here. And then he's got his hordes that are going to come. And he's going to bind up all of this. And in seven years, he's going to establish his kingdom. That sounds like a movie to me. <laughs> Let's make a movie, George. Danny and I have been talking about it for years. Get, wake up Steven Spielberg, get him saved, and let's tell it the way it is. Long time ago, Satan rebelled, came down on this planet and wrenched, and we got all this weird stuff. He had all these buildings he made, all of these mega structures, and they left them all, and God says, there you go, pal. How do you like that? And then his group hid, went into the earth and under the water. There are huge bases under there of something, and we don't know what they are. How about that? You have your government say, we got things flying around. We got things doing all kinds of crazy things. We got this thing over in Nevada called the Skinwalker Ranch, and there's all kinds of weird stuff, and we don't understand a bit. Call on Scott. He'll tell you what it really is. It's the devil. And the devil, it's his time. He's just orchestrating a big circus so people get caught up in it. But you and I know Jesus is coming soon, finishing. I hope I caught your interest. I wish some of you would just come over and visit for a while. You know, call first. <laughs> <coughs> I have all this property, tremendous of things that we want to do for God here. I don't have enough people yet. Okay, so listen. He will come and deceive many. That's what this stuff is. It's a deception. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Everyone say, how many know about so? Here, let me show you a part of that that you might not have seen. The wars and rumors war means that people are fighting amongst each other, right? Nation against nation, tribe against tribe, color against color. Satan's way in which he... Now listen carefully. The way in which Satan gets his power from us or from people, is getting them to fight with each other. So he tells the black people, you are mistreated. So you get an attitude to all the whites. Listen, God doesn't even recognize our skin color. He looks at our blood and our heart. And see, what Satan's doing is getting everybody divided up. See, when we're all divided up and mistrust one another, then you're going to see lots of wars, rumors of war. You're going to have family members fighting against each other. And Satan is a vampire. He sucks that energy off, and he directs it, redirects it, and it builds, and it builds, and anger, and anger. Somebody breaks up and divorce, all kinds of other things, because we're not wise enough to figure out we need to crawl with God and make sure we hang close with him so these things don't happen to us. How'd you get that out of this? <laughs> Pretty simple. There's only two systems. Only two. And you're in the good one. Don't leave. See that you be not troubled because all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There's the colors. And there will be famines. How many know that so? Pestilence. Did you know not all famines are by accident? Some are man-made. Poor management. All kinds of things. You put a third grader as the king of some African country and you're going to have a famine. Satan's a master of messing lives, ruining people. Thank God we don't listen to him. Watch this. I done fired myself up. I'm so excited. I got a fake leg. Thank God it, you can't kick it off, you know. I had one you could kick off. Seriously. I go, man, boom. Everybody will be looking at me like, what now? <laughs> All right, so let's go on. All right, so. For nation will rise against nation. Earthquakes, pestilence, and various places. Amen. Right there. You've seen it all. More earthquakes than we've ever seen before. Why? Because the earth is groaning. 
It's about ready to give birth to a church going back to God. So the earth is reeling. And stop. We read last week that anything that could be shaken will be removed. And so the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And that's you. Because you have God. Listen, when did God lose his last war? Has God been kicked off the throne yet? How about the throne of your heart? He's in your, you know, come on. A couple of points. Number one. I know. So he says, point one, when will these things be was the question. What will be the sign of your coming? Second question. And the third one, and what is the end of the age? And Jesus will answer all of them. So he says, take heed, you don't be deceived. So what's our first order? What's our first order from God? Don't be deceived. <laughs> what have we haven't been doing? I mean, there's, there's people out there that are preaching stuff that I wouldn't preach to my worst enemy. It's not the gospel. Gospel means good news, means encouragement, means that even while you're going through hell and back, that there's a word that you can grab hold of that God can pull you out of that. That's the gospel. You don't need to come to church and have me drill on you because of your sins. <laughs> now we're all sinners. Let's not get too excited. You know? All right, I'm meddling up. My next point is, there's wars and rumors of wars. I mean, gosh sakes. It's all there like a pregnant woman. The devil will divide people and keep trying to divide people. He'll try to divide up a church over a piano stool. Get you to start thinking weird things. Pastor doesn't like you. He's replacing you. He's doing this. He's doing that. I'm just such a bad guy. <laughs> the devil just does that. So you don't focus. So... There will be famines, right? So let's finish up with you. So in verse 9, Matthew 24 says this. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Did you notice the word then? In the first part of what we read to you, let's go back up to it and look at it. In the very last scripture in verse 8, it says, that it says all these things are the beginning of sorrows. And then the first word of the next scripture, verse 9, is what? Then. When you see a then in scripture, just to help you, it means a different event. Something has happened, and now then, something new is happening. What do you suppose happened just before the then? Right. That's where the rapture is. See, Matthew is a tax collector, so he's really good with being specific and to the point while Luke is more skewed and Mark it doesn't carry enough information Matthew's got it lined up in order and he says then you will be delivered to tribulation see right there simple so that means after we go up the world's going to go into seven years of agony first three and a half years I'm going to just talk to you about from now okay because I don't want to read all the scripture. So what's going to happen is we're going to go up. We meet God in the air, don't we? Who's the prince of power of the air? Satan is. So as soon as we go up, Jesus drives the devil to the ground. You read the book of Revelations, and we see Satan touch the ground. Woe to the nations when he comes to the ground. In other words, he's hanging in the air above your head. So don't let him poop in your brain. He is. He's floating around there. That's what we're seeing, weird stuff. He's the prince of the air. He's also the god of this world, little g. So don't overlook that. His job is to get you to look the other way. How about this one? Don't look here. Look over there. Don't look here. Look over there. That's what you're hearing in the news. Don't look here. Look over there. We call that Ponzi. We call that a switch of hands. We call that the devil's tricks. If you can't tell me the truth, shut up. I don't want to hear it. 
especially if you're going to tell me how to think. God's already doing that. Thank you. Sorry, I was a little harsh there. Moving right quick. So he says, listen. So we move, we go up. The world moves into seven years tribulation. It's also called in your Bible, Jacob's trouble. Say Jacob's trouble. Or the 70th week of Daniel. Everyone say 70th week. Daniel received a vision God lined it all up and then said when the rapture, basically not what the day it would happen, but that it would happen and all these other things would happen after it. Way back, thousands, a thousand years at least before Christ. And it's lined it all up for us and it's right there for us to read. So say, I am not with the world. Okay, how many here remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And did God get Lot and his family out? Okay, Here's a lesson. When God's getting you out of the world, that's what he's doing with you right now. He's getting you out of the world. Don't be like Lot's wife and turn around and long to go back. And I'm talking to you, brother. Don't turn around and long to go back. Because you might die this time. Hello. We don't want that. That's a word for somebody, a very serious one. So we'll just kind of leave it at that. But uh, let's, let's look at that. So the world goes into seven years of tribulation. It's broken up into two parts, three and a half years and three and a half years. In the center of it, because of lack of time, there's a thing called the abomination that maketh desolation. Everyone say that. Abomination that makes desolate. Okay? What that is is when in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist, the false Christ is going to walk into the temple in Jerusalem and declare he's the Messiah. This is called the abomination that maketh desolate. This is exactly what happened to the tribulation. Then when he does that, all hell breaks loose. The judgment, the vials, and the bowls, trumpet judgment, come on down into the earth and they'll have boils. People will ask to die and not be able to die. Thank God, guess what? Poke your neighbor and say, we're not there. We're, we're up there. Remember, when I get into this, everybody goes, ooh, eh, yeah. we're not even here. This is what the world's going to go through. So please, win as many souls you can. God's hands are open wide right now. This is the time of grace. Come unto me, come unto me. Come on to me. Come on to me, everyone. And don't stop coming. And so what happens, in the middle of the tribulation, he declares, this releases the judgments of God. And for the last three and a half years, if it wasn't just for a few people being saved, the whole world would be destroyed. That's how bad it's going to be. So what's going to happen? At the very end of the seven years of tribulation, Jesus... And his armies of heaven, all the angelic hosts he needs, and you and I, saints, we're going to saddle up, and we're going to follow Jesus, and he's going to ride back in. I don't know what, how he's going to do this, but it says on horses. He's going to ride back on in and destroy all the anti-God people that are following the Antichrist. And it says the blood will run as high as horses' bridles. And it'll fill the battle. I've seen, I've been in Israel, and I've seen Armageddon. I've seen the Valley of Amagedo. And it is just a thin way in which many armies can ride back and, and attack each other. So the Antichrist is going to think he's going to attack God, and God's going to go, wham! Just like that. And they're all going to die. <laughs> and we're all going to witness this. He's going to open his mouth and consume him with the sword of his mouth. We win! Now, the whole idea behind sharing this with you is because I was asked over and over again, where are we in this time period? Well, we're days probably, maybe hours, maybe weeks, just before God's ready to call us. How can you tell, Pastor Kerry, just by the quickening that's happening in all of your hearts? You know in your heart something is going to happen. You can't put your finger on it, but you, I'm putting your finger on it. And it's quick, you're quickening. The Bible says, as he approaches, your spirit starts to quicken. And you start to transform. Remember, when he calls us up, our old body changes. 
It has to be the power of God inside of us that quickens our body and completely remakes it with God's handiwork. And the very body that you had, with all its flaws, gets and remade. And you become perfect as you go to meet him in the air. Now, everyone, how many here would like to miss that? Good, no hands. Amen. I, I can't wait. So what should be our attitude? Our attitude should be your ticket's paid, your seat's reserved. Now, stop thinking of yourself so much and get out there because there are people who don't have their ticket yet and they don't have their seat reserved. And yet, if they heard the good news, like I'm sharing it, they would just come. What people are afraid of is the religious dinge and stigma. I went to church and somebody was rude to me. I'll never go back again. Eyes on man. Get your eyes off a of man. God will put a crabby person right next to you every time, you hot shot. So if he's there, get him saved. Don't get affected by him. We're supposed to affect the world and not the world affect us. Because we got a glorious gospel. We got an infectious God. Someone say amen. All right, so let's pray with you. How many here have a special need, maybe healing? Put your hand on it because God is in our presence to heal. George, for your back. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Don't you love my chairs? You don't fall asleep in them. Pews, come on up here, you'll fall. No. So, amen. You ready to receive? Put your hand on what eggles you. Jesus lives in you now. What I'm trying to get you to do is stop running to the altar and waiting for the pastor to put his hand on you. That's okay. But that's for the babies. Now you got God in you. Expand the mill. Let him take your flesh and heal it. So you have to ask. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to heal me. And I believe I receive it. My back, whatever it is, put your hand on that. And Lord God, I, I just thank you now because you died for my sins and sicknesses 2,000 years ago. And now I receive it. And Lord God, I believe I receive it. And says, Lord God, we don't have to be healed instantly. As we go, we're healed, depending on how our mindset is. So Lord, minister to their minds too, so they can receive all that you have for them. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. amen. I ask.